Jai Hind and welcome to Dev Talks. This is Adi H. And as you all can see, I have with me Lieutenant General Vinod Bhatia, a former DGMO of the Indian Army. When we talk about India-China relations and how the progress or the situation is developing along the line of actual control and of course between both the armies and the nations, only the right person to get information as to what the strategic picture looks like, how are we dealing with this entire thing and is it really all one-sided as being portrayed across in many uh, online platforms, media channels and news articles. Sir, thank you so much for joining me today and uh, you know taking us through this whole uh, contention between these two large nations. Uh, Jahan, and thank you, Adi. Thank you for uh, giving the opportunity to be on your platform again. It's always a pleasure. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. Thank you. Sir, the recent core commander discussion obviously you know ended with no tangible results as is being portrayed in many of media outlets and writings and so on and so forth. Whenever something like this happens, people's hope go up that something will happen now. Or it's done or it's going to happen. Whatever is supposed to happen should happen. Some basic questions do arise. Why is this dragging on for that long? I mean, this is probably going to be one of the longest standoff between India and China. Right? The first question that I'd like to ask you, sir, is that the joint statement calls these talks very constructive. How do you interpret the statement that was given out, sir? Yeah, um, uh, Adit, uh, thank you. I think the first thing we need to know is that we are talking and we are talking well. Uh, we are impatient people. As a people, very impatient. Every time we, we have a core commander's level talk, we want tangible results. We want the thing to be resolved. It's not going to happen. 14 round of talks have already taken place and we got uh, three contentious issues actually left to resolve. So the, the point is that we have to be patient about it. Negotiations happen. Uh, the fact that the meeting lasted 13 hours 13 hours is a long time. And when you talk to the Chinese, when you deal with them, my experience is that it's a very lengthy process, a very laborious process. It is up and down. Uh, we have to understand that when the Indian military is talking to the Chinese, to the PLA, the Indian military, we have a certain mandate. Hmm. So in that, we have a little bit of flexibility in what to do, what to say, and what not to say, and what not to accept, and what to accept. Whereas the PLA is the, you know, the PLA is the organ of the Communist Party. So the man who is there, the military leader, is looking looking over his shoulder at the commissar. He's got, you know, we already have four uh, uh, command, uh, the fourth commander of the WTC, the Western Theater Command. So it's not easy for them. They have to go back and uh, uh, come forward. The fact is that we are talking at the military level, we are talking at the diplomatic level, and we are talking at the political level. And nothing has escalated since June of 2020. So this is what you should be looking at. After June of 2020, we have resolved two issues, one in Pengbongso, which is the most sensitive, and one in Gogra. So we should look at the positives and we should look at the way forward. It is not that we just go and it will get resolved in a jiffy. It's not going to happen. Negotiations take time and some long to last six and a half years. As long as we are talking with them from a position of relative strength, I call it relative strength, not a position of strength, because China has certain advantages and there's a differential in the CNP, there's a differential in our terrain, uh, which is there, the differential in the infrastructure. There's also a differential in the, in, in the armies. We are experienced army, which they are not. We are a hardened army, which they are not for special altitude warfare. So when we are talking to them, we should not expect results at every, every level we talk, every time we talk. It's not going to happen. Absolutely, sir. And these are these are larger issues between two large nations. Uh, it's not something. Uh, there are also a lot many other string the strings attached between these two countries as well. It's not something as simple as that. People point towards the trade, sir. That the trade is still on. Um, why is the trade on? Decoupling has not happened. Why aren't we putting that kind of a pressure on China? Valid questions. But uh, what is your opinion, sir? I think we got to look at the you know uh, the whole thing as one. Uh, when we are talking at the military level, it does not mean that we are not talking at the political level. We are not talking at the diplomatic level. There are certain uh, uh, established uh, mechanisms and already in place. One is the special representatives talk. If you look at the special representatives, it started in uh, I think in the year 2000, uh, two, uh, 2003, uh, when the special representative was there, and both of them wanted to. The mandate given to them was to find a politically acceptable solution for the boundary resolution. Okay. And there were three steps to it. And the first step was 
to have certain you know, political parameters guiding principles. Based on that, in 2005, there was an agreement on the political parameter guiding principles. So that agreement taken place. The second and third step, we have 22 rounds of talks since 2003 onwards till 2019, the last one, 2019, December. So we've been talking. Then we have another mechanism called WMCC, which is the working mechanism for consultation and <coughs> coordination, which is headed by the GS East. So it's not that we are not talking. That that is that is talking. The political level talks have taken place between the Raksha Mantri and the foreign ministers in various places. We have to understand that prior to to China's forward deployment in May June 2020, the two leaders, that is Mr. Modi, our Prime Minister, and Xi Jinping, the President of the uh, of China had met 18 times in six years. So that is the sort of a thing we're talking about. When you talk about India-China relations, the whole thing I've seen in the context of India-China relations, the whole thing I've seen in the, in the emerging world order, uh, in the, you know, it's not post-pandemic as yet, but there's a post-pandemic emerging world order. We have to look at all other things and we have, we have to look at resolutions. And resolutions are going to happen just because we want it to happen. Resolutions are going to happen because they... There are certain relations which are there. That's how we keep on saying that China had to understand that the LAC has got to connect with India-China relations. Whereas they say, no, LAC, why, why do you want to connect it? Let's talk trade, let's talk commerce, let's talk other things. Whereas India says, no, it is the, we are talking about the whole thing. And a lot of people say, why should we trade with China? My, my point is, why should we not trade with China? If you look at it, China's trade with India is very little from Chinese viewpoint, not from Indian viewpoint. Okay. Indian viewpoint is it's growing. And we have, when we look at China and the reviewed China policy, the refreshed China policy, as some people want to call it, the refreshed China policy, the reviewed China policy should be pro India, not anti China. We are looking at anti China. If China loses, we win. It is not going to happen that way. We have to win on our own terms. Right? If China loses, uh, and I don't, I don't uh, uh, win, it's not a zero sum game. And we are used to a zero sum game. Right? <laughs> So that is what I'm saying, that we should look at what, how do we gain, how to how facilitate our aims. What is our aim along the line of actual control? The aim of the line of actual control is to ensure a status quo ante as of 2020 April. Right. We, have, we also want to ensure a peace and tranquility along the line of actual control as it prevailed in the last four decades. Right. China did what it had to do. It had a strategic intent, which even unfortunately, we are still looking at the strategic intent. Even uh, no less than the um, uh, uh, foreign minister, Mr. Jai Shankar, said that we are still looking at the for at the strategic intent of China. What did they, what did they want from us when they did this? Right. So they changed the status quo. We, we they surprised us. Fortunately, they did not take it beyond that. But we surprised them also. We surprised them by a resolve, by a, by a re resilient response along the line of actual control. We stood firm. So we are looking at a mutually acceptable, res equitable, and mutually acceptable resolution. It has to be mutually equitable. You know, I cannot say that I will do whatever I have to do and China will cannot say that I will do whatever I have to do. So mutually equitable, acceptable resolution is what we are looking at. And fortunately, we have a resolution of Monster and Cobra. The next was Hot Spring and Hot Spring going on. We, we have certain advantages. It's a long, it's a long water. It's a 3 4 8 kilometer long boundary. They have certain advantages. We have certain advantages. We have many advantages rather. It's not that we don't have advantages. They have many advantages too. So it is not that we don't have leverages or we you we, know, we uh, speaking to them position of you know uh, uh, weakness. No, we are speaking in equal terms. We have to understand that. But resolution takes time. Negotiations take time, and patience is required. Absolutely agree with you, sir. And as a matter of fact, uh, you know there are news articles which are coming out in a couple of uh, platforms that I've also read across where a lot of tactical things are being spoken about, and I don't want to get into that because. Uh, tactically, it's a very narrow-based discussion when you talk about a particular valley or a particular point or a particular uh, this thing. But a lot of people kind of uh, compared to the position that we position of strength that we held when we had the Kailash range to the factor that do we have any such leverages over them in the current areas of the standoff? Uh, just by looking at the way that the things are dragging on, it seems like to me as an outside observer who does not have tactical knowledge of that area, that we might have certain leverages. That is the reason why this thing is not getting resolved. So uh, if, if they were in a position of advantage, they would have pushed us to whatever negotiation that they wanted to. They can't do that because there is something. Would you agree to something like that? 
Yeah, I think we have to understand, you know, uh, the Kailash range has been, you know, we occupied it in a very speedy and surprise movement and surprising the Chinese. What was Kailash range all about? It is, it is officially important. There's no doubt what is officially important heights which dominate a certain PLA garrison at Moldo, right? So, but more importantly, it was a strategic signal to China that we can do what you're doing to us, right? That is more important. It's a strategic signal which is more important. And we told them that, look, we also can do it, what you're doing. And a, a long boundary, uh, like the Indochina boundary, has gone with the Kailash ranges. So the Kailash range is a QPQ option. It had served its purpose because every QPQ option has a certain finite value in time and space. Right? It cannot be infinite. I cannot occupy Kailash and say, okay, now China will do whatever I have to say, whatever we say, they will do that. It's not going to happen, right? It, it had a certain finite value in time and space. And we achieved the aim in that for the first time, we got the PLA moving back from Pengongso, where it had come and occupied certain areas to Fingers 4. And they went back to the old position at Fingers 8. So we have to understand that. We have to understand that the negotiation started off because of that, because we did that. Now, once we have given a strategic intent that we can do it, they understand that. And that is why I keep on saying there is no escalation whatsoever. At the cost of repetition, you know, we go into tactical details. I think tactical details, let us leave it to the military commanders. They are more aware. We, 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 you know, I see so many of them, so many maps coming on the line of actual control. Let me assure you, the line of actual control is not known to any one of them whatsoever. It is line of actual control, line of perceptions. And that is known to a very few in the military. It is not that it is given out. It is, it is not a defined line. It is, it is a line we would not like people to know because the negotiations depend on that. Okay. Similarly, Chinese have never given their LAC. Every time you, you, give, you give them a line of actual control, which is which you think is the Indian line of actual control, try giving the Chinese line of actual control. So all these, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to criticize the experts. They have a job to do. They're doing a good job. We, we have to have a responsible media and, and media should come out of that. But why, why I'm trying to say, what I'm trying to say is we should not add on to the Chinese propaganda machinery, the Chinese psychological operations, China three, three uh, you know, warfare policy, three warfare philosophy of public opinion, psychological warfare and legal warfare. Look at what the Chinese have done on the 1st of uh, January in the, on the New Year's. Not an inch of, you know, territory has been lost. So even China is under question. If there was a blizzard in, uh, uh, and they lost a few people, four million hits on the, they, they, everyone wants to know what has happened. So it is not that they are not concerned; they are also concerned. And let me assure you, uh, I don't think China, uh, uh, you know, war is the last resort. War is not going. It's not that you know, just just you go to war with any nation. War is, war is not fought like this. China and India are two nuclear nations. We are two strong nations. We have more than thirty percent, thirty-three percent of the world's, you know. Humanity resides in these two countries. Old civilizations, we have linkages. It's not that we don't have linkages. We have mutual concerns. We have shared interests. So we have to look at all these things. We cannot just go to war. It's not war is not an option. War is not an option in China, war is not an option in India. You don't go to war like this. There, there is a world which is there, a world beyond, and we've got to look at our own people. Absolutely agree with you, sir. And you know the whole deal of sorting out a standoff like this by tactical maneuvers to me as an as a, somebody who just is a student of uh, this entire thing seems very narrow minded because it will probably solve a situation in that tactical small little theater but they could create another situation for you in another place altogether uh, so we basically it will be a cat and mouse game either we climb up to some height or they climb up to some height and you know it will just continue on and that's where my second question comes to. So the Indian approach uh, towards this entire problem has been a whole approach. And that's something that I would like to bring about. And I believe that. Why do I say this? It's also military coercion. We've got our forces. We've got the development happening. We are, we are also deploying new and new weapons. Uh, we are developing stuff. There's a huge amount of testing which is happening militarily. Diplomatically as well, there is a lot of work which is happening in terms of getting the world community around and making them understand. We also had a recent uh, 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 statement from the United States, uh, you know, uh, Secretary of uh, State saying that we are closely monitoring the situation between India and China. So that means the information is being passed around with regards to what's happening. 
economic steps have been taken trade is up but there's a lot of decoupling which is happening india is trying to do something here and there so would you agree that to sort out the china problem it's not just a military approach which is required it's a whole government approach or a whole of nation approach which would be required to kind of push them back or deter them for that matter yeah i think uh, uh, our aim should deter china aggressive behavior that's the aim and, and that aim is achieved uh, uh, in all spheres be it diplomatic be it informational be it military or economic and also at the political level so we uh, uh, you know what i call it we have to have a 3d approach or the 3d strategy rather uh, defend the lc because you have to be strong at the lc if you're not strong there then the others can't really you know support what you're doing and then dominate the ocean which is the strategic concern strategic vulnerabilities of china and most importantly data channel adjustment behavior by bind to balance with other nations where we have convergence and common interests that is exactly what trying, what you are trying to say so you getting everything together the diplomatic is very important it also leads to commerce it also leads to economic dependence and interdependencies we also have to take the neighbors along see it's not that it, just indian china affected the the neighbors are equally important whether it is nepal whether it is bhutan myanmar bangladesh for that matter sri lanka maldives it's a region and we already have you know pakistan as an adversary on the west which is totally let's say a proxy of china situation in afghanistan so we'll have to look at all these factors and of course the un the west the west uh, our quad is very important to us right so what we are doing is the i think in every sphere in every domain uh we are uh, uh, you know we are taking steps to deter china's aggressive behavior and that is i think one of the reasons why the no escalation has taken place for so we have to understand that but other escalation would have taken place and then it the neutral third law comes into being what is neutral third law every action equivalent of a reaction we would have gone to action reaction solution you occupy a mountain you occupy a mountain you occupy a hill you occupy a hill you go by real something you go by something so that is something which rather he has done after that rather we have done after that and we are talking of you know high altitude at uh, 5000 meters what is 5000 meters there the temperatures are low but the tempers are high right so despite that we see a very disciplined army indian army we see a very disciplined pla let's give them the credit for it that is the most strange thing that under galwan after galwan there was escalation galwan also escalation would have taken place had kal santosh babu and they may not retaliated effectively as they did so it is not that you know once it started off the they they initiated the skirmish with whatever weapons you know to be or not but they but the our, our troops gave it back to them in equal might or more so that is why we don't don't see any escalation of that happening galwan was not repeated anywhere so they have also learned the lessons that it is not going to be so easy right they have a cost to pay and no one wants to pay cost they don't want to escalate i think right right from the beginning they also look at solution that they, that is why they keep coming back to the table but having said that let me also say we have to keep building capabilities and an asset capacities it is not that you know they will not fight a war they will not go to war they will not go to war if you are strong if you are weak you are asking what trouble there's nothing you know so great about it in the theory so you have to build capabilities build cap- enhance capacity and that is exactly what is happening we are building infrastructure but despite the very pushed infrastructure we have to understand that there is a differential they have a excellent multimodal infrastructure there which they built over the years we neglected it we are doing it now there i trust i but it will take time thank you you know that's that absolutely sir i agree with that because it's not something that you can do overnight especially in that kind of a terrain um uh, having said that sir with the kind of build and the kind of reports that we see of the chinese building up their infrastructure uh you know the the bridge in pengong so that came across in the news uh, doesn't it also tell you that their infrastructure although pretty good there's no denyance as you say uh also has certain gaps that they're trying to fill up uh, you know certain vulnerabilities that they're trying to address and it's not hunky dory over the, that side as is normally portrayed within india sir yeah well, i think uh, what they had done was they had uh, focused on the strategic mobility earlier right strategic operational mobility where they had this highways they the, they upgraded the airfields uh, they had the qtr the, the railway lines and they extended the jartong and other places mm. and now they are also equally 
uh, focusing on your uh, what what i call the battlefield mobility right so they they are bringing the last mile connectivity the battlefield mobility uh, into say what uh, Britain, uh, mountains are very bad uh, you have to uh, in many areas you have to you know you have to go to the valleys and you have to come back you can't just cross the mountain Yes. So they are, of course, it's not that their infrastructure is complete. It is not complete. It's all there. Always be a work in progress infrastructure. Of work in progress. So they have learned from their mistakes. If you look at Pengongso, Pengongso, you know, there's no connectivity in the two banks. They have to go back. In our case, the Pengongso, we have we have got better connectivity, right? Less time taken from move from north bank to south bank. In their case, the time differential was more, and so they are. They are now, as reported, they are building this bridge uh, uh, on their side, right? On their side of the LAC. I clarify that on their side of the LAC, not that's our territory still. They still occupy 38,500 kilometers square kilometers of our territory. I'm not denying that, but that's been there since since the 50s. Right? There's nothing new. But the fact remains, when we talk about LAC, and our aim is very categorical, very clear. And that is what we are working at, and that is why the negotiation takes place. And I'm sure, I, I I feel certain that the way we are going about it in a very logical manner, synergizing all our strengths, I I do feel that given that, and time should be at our side. There's no no hurry in this. That we will have a equitable mutual resolution to the problem. So one of the fears about. people who watch china and i have actually started doing that pretty hardcore I, i read almost five or six china daily newspapers every day or news articles and, uh, sorry news forums and uh, a lot of writings about china which is being done by the china study groups all around the world one of the things that comes out of all those things is when china is vulnerable they try and create a problem for themselves outside um, alongside their borders and this is something that we saw in the 60s with us in the 70s with the vietnamese they tried and created created an issue and stuff like that if the chinese do decide to create an issue because they want to divert and there are problems within china that's something we know the economy is slowing down birth rate is down to you know 0.034% over last year which is absolutely minimal uh, they've got an aging population surging covid economy in terms of their real estate sector is taking a bounce so there's got to be a little bit of an unrest within china would they be for the lack of a better word stupid enough of actually picking up a fight with india not knowing very clearly that they will be able to actually dominate or achieve their objectives just to divert their population in interest as the ccp is concerned sir no uh, one thing we should look uh, we should try to the chinese they look long and they look deep. they have a long term strategy and they look deep and it's a communist country where uh, no uh, where there's no opposition mm-hmm. there is dissent in definitely there's some dissent there's reports of dissent against uh, president xi but uh, that dissent is uh, normal in any any any, po- any power game that the delhi power games out there but what you say is they have opened up one too many front section if you look at the flash points of the world the five most risky flash points are the most you know bottom flash points for conflict all over china connect that is taiwan south china sea the east sea you look at korea and you look at india india yeah. right so they all over china connect so it is not that uh, china is only looking at india it has opened up one too many fronts that's what keep saying we talk about two front war well yes definitely we have to but we have to self align you know atmanirbhar is not only in in the terms of defense manufacturing at every aspect uh, tomorrow you do not know what turn the geopolitics takes or your strategies take so we have to be self reliant in everything well if we get the support of other nations very good if we don't the support is too bad like when 1971 war we didn't have the support so imagine uh, the us uh, you know they tried to uh, uh, the, what they tried on the 11th of the december the seventh fleet was in the bay of bengal so you cannot bank on anyone you have to bank on yourself first and what you get additional is fine so when pakistan when china has opened up to any fronts we have to understand that china also is vulnerable and china is definitely uh, they they look long and like the deep the study they they are not like to do war but yes if they find an opportunity where we weak why not so that is what i keep saying prepare when you 
you know, always hope for the best, work for the best, but be prepared for the worst. So it is not that China will not fight a war. So I can, you know, after I retired, I started attending some of these, you know, think tanks and the strategy community. Everyone said, Jan Saab, kya baat karte, ladai hogi ni kabhi bhi. There'll never be a war. The last war you fought was in 1971-45 years ago. I said, look, I, I, I agree with you totally. Why should I fight? I'm not here to fight wars. The armed force is not here to fight wars. Armed forces are here to ensure peace. <laughs> the difference between fighting war and ensuring peace. Okay, you want peace, security, stability for what? For development. Without peace and stability, how can you have development? So that's what I'm trying to say. Prepare for the worst. And that is exactly what the chief of the army staff, General Ravne, has said. And he's made it very categorical. I think it's a very categorical, clear signal and a statement coming from the chief of the army staff. Very, very nuanced, very categorical, very clear. He says, we are prepared. And that is exactly what he's doing. And that is exactly what we are doing. So we have to understand that and not, you know, look at everyone like me who, who is very busy, you know, churning out papers and writing things. Look at the chief statement. That is what actually mean what what it means is we are prepared and what does he do when he say, when he says that you know very it's a it's a two line statement but what does it say what does it signal it signals to four different constituencies one it signals to china that look we are prepared two it signals to the world that india can take care of itself and territorial integrity three it reassures our people which is very important you know we we we, we see the global time we are not seeing chief statement unfortunately not <laughs> It reassures our people that, look, we are there, so wow, please. And it, tells, it is a signal to the armed forces, be prepared, be prepared. Right? So that is why I look I look at the statement as a well, as an excellent statement. And, and it is so well delivered, uh, very well delivered. And that is what the signal we should be doing. Last question, sir. I think a lot many enthusiasts, I won't call them experts, but a lot of many enthusiasts that we see read online that India is being weak and so on and so forth want to deal with China the same way that you deal with Pakistan, open up some shelling, kill a couple of posts. I think it's a feel-good factor that one feels inside when we see the enemy posts going up. But, you know, my observation is that we've not done that even to Pakistan for the past, since February last year. Uh, having said that, we also know that the Pakistanis have been isolated in the international community, much to the credit of the diplomacy and the steps which are being taken by India. Uh, this, the SARC summit, which is you know proposed, went down the tubes. The OIC went down the tubes. There's so much which is happening right now, and the Pakistanis are actually feeling it. It's an easier target. China will be a longish affair. It'll be a more you know strength. It'll it'll require a lot many more partners from across the world. What is your opinion, sir? Is it that, you know, uh, the portrayal of nothing actually getting moved shows that India is weak or it's the other way around. We need to be slow and we need to be steady for a strategic goal, which is, has a larger and a long-term effect to actually come into our benefit, sir. You know, you're absolutely right. We should trust our people. We should trust our armed forces. We trust our government. They are doing the best. It's their charter to do what they are doing. Yes, question them. Of course, there is the parliament. You question them. I have got no issues with that. But the fact is, don't come out and say, we should do this, we should do that. You are sitting far away from the realities, not realities. Please go. Leave it to you. You have trusted some people. But we, you have the armed forces. You trusted them all. And they have never let you down. There is no reason to let you down. So please trust them. Trust the military leadership. Trust the political leadership. No, they are the ones who are responsible, who are accountable, who have, who have the authority to do. It is okay, I keep writing, fine, I keep questioning, fine. You know, we should do this, we should do that. Look, I have to take a, you know, I have to take an overview of everything I do. It is just not, you know, taking off one particular post or, you know, pushing more. I, I hear so many times, why can't you push more militarily? We are stronger. Or, come on, damn it. It, is, it, it, it doesn't happen that way. It is not a guttam gutta going on a, on a bar. Or the roadside, it's not a roadside fight. No, they're, they're two nations. And we are doing what we have to do. I think we have done exceedingly well along the line of actual control. And we, we find a lot of theories. The LAC has become the LC now. Sorry, LC is defined. LC is a different ball game altogether. LC is, you know, since February, it is, it is not live. Whether it's, it's almost a live LC. We, we have had ceasefire since 2002, uh, 2003 November. 
this was in 2013 i was the i was the dgmo when we had the dgmo level talks the first of its kind we reiterated the ses5 so it's very easy to sit back and say why can't you push them out military why can't you just shove them out it's not it's not a, a man out they just pick them up and throw them back it's not going to happen that way right so uh, i think let the many anyway, it's good that they keep putting pressure i'm not saying that it's good but they should be understand they should understand that there are certain systems in place certain structures in place who have the right inputs and who know what to do so please trust them have a self belief no we indians are very critical of ourselves tell no, i can criticize anything i can i can tear apart anyone and criticize but tell me to create i don't even write i don't even know how to start creating anything so please my only request is trust the people you have entrusted them already trust them to perform trust them to do what the best for the country and they are doing it already so look at what has happened look at the politics don't say 14th quarter what a meeting failed how did it fail tell me 13 hours of talks had it failed if within 13 minutes the pla had walked out i would have suggested it failed. i would have said that but if 13 hours you are talking how did it fail that that pla commander is not there to alone to take decisions so the military could not alone to take decisions let me tell you that these are these are not decided right on the table there are certain mandate you go there you talk within that mandate and it, uh, he comes with his mandate you go with your mandate and there is congress and convergence even if when in, in february when we disengaged from kanpur also it happened all of a sudden everyone said the talks had failed because nothing had come out and then one day i think it was 10th 11th february if i remember correctly yes. when we started pulling back from bengal so suddenly you know talks have succeeded so let, let us give things time but look at the change what's come out the 13 talks i think were bad we could we saw a very condescending approach by china uh, by the spokesperson and all in there this thing but this time it is not so this so, time no. there is been a you know official statement Uh, which matches, which is which is what uh, you know, Congress and the statements with the two sides. Yeah. So let us look at positives and uh, let's not you know try to say push them out militarily and push them out. Let's see when the time comes. There's the time on our side. We already deployed out. There's the Indian Army has always been deployed in the land of actual control and strength. This was the defense was our strategy. So we have no issues. We are experts at high altitude warfare. We have the experience. So trust them to stand. With the with the resolute response out there, we we are deployed already. It is the Chinese who have come forward. It is the Chinese cause which have raised the PLA. The PLA used to come from their uh, barracks and come and patrol and go back. Today they are sitting on the heights. They are feeling the pinch. We were we were already sitting out there in any case. Nothing has changed for the Indian army. Absolutely, our our we've not made any new bases or anything for for that matter. For as far as the army is concerned, they're the same Galwan. uh dsdv on the same basis that we are operating out of I mean, it's not something new and i absolutely agree with you sir when you say that it's not easy to push them out or it's even if we are able to push them out militarily what stops them from creating another issue it's the larger picture of deterrence that we need to create from the chinese that listen when you do stuff like this there's going to be a cost and that's when the lesson will be learned by slapping three chinese soldiers here and there and throwing them behind the line is not going to kind of give us the result that we we desired and that's something that we saw in sumdrongchu after a long term push was done things were quiet for a long time um six and a half years yes and things were quiet after that it, it, for 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 a really long time as and when the chinese again started building up their military they started poking again that's a different story altogether and they probably looked at our weaknesses as well we were not focusing that much on our military development on our infrastructure they said okay that's not doing any why why not you know take some advantage and anybody would do that i mean uh, the uh, loc inch forward policy is something written by india itself so that's something which which is bang open there sir so thank you so much i think you've brought about uh, you know this whole factor and this whole narrative which is being created and we have again i'm going to use something that you said we, we like to be the fastest fingers first and push across silly you know uh, propaganda videos that actually leave us black faced because when they get busted open by chinese itself uh, this whole propaganda video of the the so called galwan celebration was not rubbished by indians it was rubbished by the chinese it came out in vivo which was picked up by the indian news media and then created a whole tamasha out of it so it's it's important that we kind of stream we understand the larger strategic picture as you very rightly brought out 
and we trust the men on the ground i think so that's that's the key to the situation today between india and china of course we all hope that things do get better but of it and we do get back into a you know situation of peace but it's going to take time as you very rightly brought out thank you sir till next time for another subject on another day jai hind thank you ali let's hope for the best but be prepared for the worst yes sir thank you very much jai hind jai hind and the viewers jai hind sir